And I've been preaching and teaching here a lot longer than that. Yeah. And God has done some awesome things. And it's, it, it's mind-boggling, it's kind of mind-blowing that there was actually that many that are there. Uh, I don't know what the total number would be, but I mean, we're missing probably another six years prior to that. So, God, uh, God has done some wonderful things. Let's stand for the reading of His Word if you're able to. We're going to just read verses 11 down through verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 2. It still feels weird. Alright, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God, in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So we're going to launch. Uh, we're going to launch out of this uh, verse fourteen. It's He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. I want to preach this this evening on stick with the middle man. <laughs> Stick with the middle man. He broke down the wall that was between us, and he's in the middle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for meeting with us, Lord. Take this time and use it through the Holy Spirit of God. Touch each mind, heart. Uh, enlighten our understanding, Father, that we may grasp a little bit more of you and see more of you and less of us in this time together. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In today's world, they are all about cutting out the middleman. Now, in a business sense, um, that might be okay. You know, they're, they're looking about how to reduce costs. So, well, if we go directly from this, this one to point A to point B... Instead of point A taking it and sending it to point B, it goes through a point, uh, you know, it's like this little side jog, and then get over to point B. Well, we're going to send it to C, and then C is going to send it to B. Instead of going from A to B. They want to send it somewhere else, or they, they want you to go through somebody else to get to somebody else. And sometimes that's just irritating. In the, in the business sense, and when we're talking about services and things like that, it's, it's a lot better to just go direct. You know, and that, that mentality is, is fine in the secular sense and in the business sense, but too many people are trying to carry this line of thinking into a spiritual realm. They want to get to God and skip Jesus. That's right. That's what they want to do. And that's why I, I, uh, Matt and I were talking about which image to use. And, uh, and this image came up, and you'll notice the guy in the middle with the, little, the, with the little line where you can cut him out. But it's up to you. You're the one with the scissors. You can leave it alone, or you can cut it out. Each person has their own scissors, and they decide what they're going to do with Jesus. You're either going to leave him there and stick with him, 
or you're going to cut him out and try some other way. I don't recommend cutting him out. No. Stick with the middle man. Right? There's just many who seek to get to the Father by skipping over the Son. You cannot reach the Father without the Son. And I want you to see tonight how Jesus really is in the middle of everything. There's a lot of things that we're going to talk about. And of course, time would not permit to mention all the things regarding his position and where he's in the middle of. But God gave me some things that I believe would be a help to you because it was a help to me to enlighten me about just where Jesus is at concerning his position. So the very first thing that came to my mind was he's in the middle of the Trinity. He's in the middle of the Trinity and he's bringing unity, power, and love of God. He stands between the Father and the Holy Ghost. Now each one of these points you're going to see what God brings and where he's standing. And who he's in the middle of. So, so, so notice that. He's in the middle of the Trinity. He brings unity. Because they're three in one. It's not two and one part removed. It's three and one. And these three are one. And they agree together in one. There's unity there. Brings unity. Power. And the love of God. And he stands between the Father and the Holy Ghost. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You hear it a lot in the church, especially during the baptism, where I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And then that's when you're buried in the likeness of His death, and raised to walk in newness of life. It is the power. We've talked about that before, that each one has power individually, and, and they are all power. But together... You see the full effect of the power. All right? God, and I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to think that Jesus only had a third of the power of the, of the Godhead. They all have the power of the Godhead. They are all one. All right? But them together is just mind-blowing power. Like, it's, 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 it's almost not even worry to put it into words. The three of them together. And that's why when I said, when, we, when you're studying one, when you're studying Jesus, find the Father and find the Spirit in, in, in your study so that you can keep them to connected. And that brings power to your study in the Word. Amen. Okay, don't just say, I've set out on a course to learn more about the Holy Spirit, and I'm just going to have to ignore the Father and ignore the Son in this study. No, you can't do that. And I want you to understand right now that if you're studying the Word of God, you cannot separate them that way. You will not find an individual specific study on any one of them without the others being included in the story. That's right. Mm -hmm. They're all interweaved. You've got to keep them there. That will bring life, that will bring power to your study of the Word of God if you include them all and bring them all and find out where they all were at this particular point and where you're studying. And that will bring life to that. 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He's in the middle of the Trinity. Secondly, He's in the middle of the temple. He's in the middle of the temple. What is He bringing? He's bringing truth through God's Word. He stands between the righteous and the unrighteous. He's right in the middle. So he's standing he's in the middle of the temple. He's bringing the truth through God's word. Remember, he was expounding to them daily. He was in the temple. And he was even from 12 years old and, and, and up he was in the te to temple teaching. And they were astonished at his doctrine. Who's this little kid that's coming into the temple and expounding these things with authority? Telling the truth of the word of God. He's right in the middle of the temple. Bringing truth through God's 
word, and he stands between the righteous and the unrighteous. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 14 and 15, the Bible says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. They did not like that at all. And in Matthew chapter 26, verse 55, the Bible says that in that same hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. <laughs> He's there daily. He was right there in the middle of them. Right in the middle of the temple. They came to him. He healed them. He expounded the scriptures. He was telling them God's plan. He was telling them the word. All they knew was one part of it. See, God really isn't a God of, you know, of half disclosure. He wants you to know the whole thing. Just the same way, and, and a lot of Christians today will be like, what's all this Old Testament stuff? What's all that? How does that help me? That was just all back then, and it doesn't do a thing for me in the present day and listen because he wants you to know how things were because in the New Testament you would only know the New Testament things you would never come to appreciate that which you have because you're not under law anymore you need to know what the law was you need to know why it was there you need to know why it's good that you're not under it <laughs> Those Old Testament things let us see the whole picture of the Word of God from the very beginning. And the New Testament helps those in the Old Testament. And see, that's who Jesus was when He came down. He came down. That's when you find the New Testament coming down in the middle of the Jews and to bring the new, the second part of it all for them. He wanted them teaching them daily so that they could start getting a picture of what was to come. But all they had was what they knew of all the old stuff. That's why they hated him. They, he brought something to them that they never knew, that they never heard. And to them it seemed like blasphemy because now here's this guy saying that he's the son of God. Don't we know Mary? Is Mary and Joseph? Don't we know this guy? We knew him. We've seen him. We've, 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 we've seen all the stuff that he's done. <clears throat> they were confused about all that. So, you know, you have to take a little bit with a grain of salt because that's all they knew was the law. The veil was over their heart. That's all they knew. Now, when something new came down, and that's why they were after Paul, because then he was trying to add the Gentiles into the mix. And now that was an extra kindle to the fire. That's just like throwing a, a bucket of gasoline in a fire. Not only was it new because it was given by direct revelation of God to him, but it was also including those that they had no dealings with. Now you're trying to take salvation is of the Jews. You're trying to take my salvation and my promise of God and give it to those people that we don't even have anything to do with. That's why they sought his life, to kill it. They vowed that they wouldn't sleep until they took his life. Isn't that funny how that didn't happen? Hmm. It's interesting. But he was in the middle of the temple bringing the truth Standing between the righteous and the unrighteous. Thirdly, he's in the middle of the fire. Middle of the fire, bringing safety to those that trust in him. I don't have to go very long into this. Of course, you guys know the story of the three Hebrew children. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 23, 24, 25. It says, these, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down 
into the midst of, a bur of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, listen at this, walking in the midst, in the middle, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Walking in the middle of the fire took the burn out of the flame. Because he's in the middle of that fire. Yeah, that, that was kind of a terrible situation to find yourself in. And it just goes to show that they stood for what was right. They would not bow. They would not bow at the sound of that, uh, of that horn that goes off. And when you hear the trumpets, you bow down and worship the image of me. No, we're not going to do it. We know our God is able to deliver, but if He chooses not to, we're still. We would rather die than do that. Where are Christians like that today? I wonder how many would bow to that image today if that were the case. Because in one form or fashion or another, they're bowing to something else. If you could stay home and you could have been here, then you're bound to something else. Let's just be honest. Yeah. If you're able to come and you know you have a responsibility to come and God wants us here and we know that and when you choose to stay at home, you're able to come, you're not sick, you're not afflicted, you don't have providentially hindered, you're not any of those things and you're just staying home because you want to stay home, well, let me tell you something. You've bowed to an idol. Because it's keeping you from God. It's between you and God. So he's in the middle of the fire. He's also in the middle of the water. Bringing peace and calm in the storms. He stands between the storm and peace. He's right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of it. Mark chapter 4 verse 38 through 41 and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on the pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? He's in the middle of the storm. Right in the middle. And we find him walking out another section of Scripture. We find him standing out walking in the rain, in the storm, on the sea. And he's passing the ship. Because the wind was blowing and contrary to them. And they were finding a real rough time getting where they needed to go. Have you ever seen somebody driving so slow that you said, I could walk faster than that? That happened. <laughs> That's what happened that day on the water. Jesus said, I'm going to, you got y'all go ahead. I'm going to walk. And he walked faster. But he got on there, and he, and he took care of that. He was in the middle of the water. He's in the middle of the cross, bringing atonement to all who believe. He stands between forgiveness and condemnation. Between heaven and hell, he is the bridge. I remember so well. Uh, so long ago, when I was in junior church, but a wee lad, I was in the I was in junior church, and, and uh, our son and, and the junior church teacher drew the first time I'd ever seen this. On the, they took the big paper and they drew they drew this here, and then a line down, and then this here, and then a line down, 
And there are two patches of land and a giant hole right in the middle of it. One side was heaven, one side was hell, and there was no way to get from one side to the other. And she drew, they drew all the people on this side. This, this land here, or no, I'm sorry, it was one, one, one side was earth and one side was heaven. That's what it was. Hell was in the pit. All the people were on the earth and they were walking that way towards where heaven should be, but instead they were walking to the pit. And then what she did is she took and she drew the cross with this part sticking down into the pit, making a perfect bridge to go from one side to the other. So that's what Jesus did. When he took, he brought, when he died on the cross, it was just like God took the cross and put it there and made a, a, a clear walking path for you to go from earth to heaven and, and pass over hell that you wouldn't have to perish. I, that always stuck in my mind. I mean, even all these years later, it's been a long time since I've been in junior church. More time than I care to mention. But I still remember it. I still remember it. And that's why it, it's very important that we that we make the Bible real to people that because they're going to remember it. Okay? He was in he was on the cross. He stood between forgiveness and condemnation. In Luke chapter 23 verse 32 and 33, there were also two other male factors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, Christ was in the middle of, of the both of them. And we know that one accepted him and wanted him to remember him when he came into his paradise. The other one represented the, the, the world and, and their view and said, oh, if you're Christ, he joined in with what the, the crowd was saying. If you be Christ, bring yourself down in us. Don't forget about me. Bring us all down. We'll believe. But he didn't come down. Because you know why? There's more people that needed to be saved than just that crowd that was there. Now, if those were all the people that would ever be, maybe he, maybe he would have, I, I don't know. We don't know. He would have probably still went through and, and, and still not come down. I don't believe he would have come down. Because you have to have blood in order to, in, in order to have remission of sin. But in all of that, he was right in the middle of it. Now, he's in the middle of heaven. He's in the middle of heaven bringing intercession for the saints of God. He stands between blessing and cursing. He's there to make intercession. Alright? He's dealt that out. He's there uh, for that job of being there. Standing between the blessing and the cursing. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man... Christ Jesus. He stands between. He's in the middle. He's in the middle of heaven. He brings intercession for the saints of God. And thank God He does that. Boy. And the Spirit, of course, we know the Spirit does make intercession as well. When you're when you can't pray and you can't, and you're it says that He will intercede. And take, and take that with groanings that cannot even be uttered. He will also, because He's within you, He, he also does those things. Okay? So he shares, he shares in that ministry of intercession between us and God. But that is, that the Bible claims that Jesus is the, the, the one. He is the, the mediator between God and men. Because he he's both at the same time. He he knows what it's like to be all God, and he knows what it's like to be all man. He knows how we're tempted. He knows how we falter. He knows how we fail. He's watched it firsthand. Even that those disciples that couldn't even stay awake 
long enough to pray for an hour. He's seen it. Who better to represent us than he who was us? And that's an amazing thing. The last point is probably one of my favorites. I know it's going to be Matt's favorite because he's always talking about it. <laughs> but the last place I find here is he's, uh, that God gave me is that he's in the middle of the air. <laughs> Amen. He's in the middle of the air. <laughs> Bringing physical redemption to all believers. And he will stand between earth and heaven, catching the church away. He's between earth and heaven. He is in the middle of the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 through 18. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. It's a comfort. It's a comfort to know that we believe that He died, that He rose again, and that He's coming again. He's bringing those that have, that have gone on to be with Him and he's bringing them back. The graves once again will burst open. Those bodies are coming out to meet that. They're to be changed just like we are. We're all getting changed at the same time. Our bodies, whether we be alive and remain or six feet under the ground, we're getting changed. We're coming up. And those, those, those spirits will meet the glorified bodies. And we'll just be changed in the instant, the twinkling of an eye, and we'll all go up together in the middle of the air. And then that's when he takes us back to heaven. We have seven years of judgment for the Christian, all while the tribulation and the great tribulation are going on. Then he comes down, the devil is bound, he sets up his kingdom. Jesus sets up the millennial reign of Christ. He rules with a rod of iron. And there's so many different things that we can talk about. But I just wanted you to see tonight that he's literally in the middle of everything. He's in the middle. Don't cut out the middle man. Stick with the middle man. He doesn't want to be cut out. Would anybody? Nobody wants to be left out. Nobody wants to be cut out. Nobody wants to be pushed aside. God is no different. God doesn't want to be pushed aside. God doesn't want to be cut out of your life. God doesn't want to be cut out of your plans. God doesn't want to be cut out. He wants to be included in those things. Even the small matters of the heart. Even the small matters of your life. God is still interested. Whether it's just blessing your food. That you wouldn't choke on it. Or maybe that it wouldn't stick to your ribs. Amen. <laughs> I pray that way over every donut I consume. Let this pass, let this bitter cup pass through me. <laughs> Get it over. Don't take the flavor. Take out the flavor from me. You know. Oh, <laughs> Remove not the custard from this donut. Whether it's a simple thing of just blessing and sanctifying the food that you eat or where you're going to live or where you're going to work, or what you're going to do, or how to raise your family, or, or, or what the things that you need to do in your life are, even the big weighty things. God wants to be in more than just the big things. He said that we should give attention to the little things. 
And if he's mindful that we need to that we need to work on the little things, because you know what happens in those little things? They get big. They get to be big things. And when you don't deal with something when it's a little thing, you're gonna have a whole monster. You know, uh, you find this out too, and I think one of a really good in, uh, really good illustration of that would be a weed. If you know, you think, well, I know it's it's a chore to weed, and I, I don't really do too much of the gardening thing or the flower thing, but I, I know that you don't want them boogers in there, and uh, and they just they just are, are terrible, you know, and they're ugly and, and all of those things, uh, but if you get them when they're little, you remove just put a little dirt. Just a little bit of just it's, it just messes it up just a little bit. Nothing that you can't just do that and pat it down and it's good. But you let that thing grow and grow and grow. And now it looks like a tree. <laughs> now it's a weed sapling. It's a thing we don't even know. And you jerk that thing out of your garden, you're going to have a pretty big hole to fill. In so much that you may have to go buy some topsoil and fill that thing. <laughs> so don't let that happen in your life. You know why we get holes in us? Because we leave things there too long growing. The wrong things. If we'll find them, and that's what I love about the Word of God. Messages like we heard this morning. We can we can hear these things, the things we've been teaching on and preaching on. You can find those little things. And, oh, that's really not that big of a deal, but it's going to be. And the longer you wait to deal with it, the bigger hole it's going to leave in you. It's something to think about. Food for thought. Good marinade. <laughs> I'm all about that. So don't let that happen. But above all, leave him where he belongs. He's in the middle. Leave him there. That's where he's supposed to be. And don't not include him in everything. So as they come for the invitation, you guys can come on up. Get ready for the invitation.